Over the years, we've found some pretty unique off-the-beaten-path and under-the-radar museums and collections like this one in Brattleboro, Vermont. What's more, this is the rare collection you can play with, if you know how to play. If only I knew Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> These surviving slate buildings are what remain of what was one of Brattleboro's biggest employers in the late 19th century. Over several city blocks, the SD Organ Company manufactured reed organs, distinctive for their style and great craftsmanship, making SD an industry star. They were the largest manufacturer of reed organs in the world. Famous people played them. Wagner wrote a testimonial about the SD organ. By the 20th century, the SD company switched from making reed organs to pipe organs, and call it organ failure, the factory finally closed in 1960. So why, you may wonder, is this building still full of working organs? Because when you're about to move or downsize somewhere and you have an old organ lying around that says Brattleboro, Vermont on it, you may not want to toss it in the trash. You call up Brattleboro, Vermont, and say, gee, I have this organ. And the, for many years, the Historical Society said, well, if you can get it here, we'll take it. And they did. Hundreds making this the rare museum whose collection has generated itself, from kid-sized organs to ones that have been to war. They were made for the chaplains. They sold to the wow. military. So it folded up into a big crate, and right. you could literally carry it. Right. What's most unique, though, is that all of the organs here are meant to be played, and visitors take full advantage. Oh, definitely, yep. They bring their music. It's a very unusual museum because we want everybody to play everything. There are some sites of historical interest that are not off the beaten path at all. In fact, this one's hiding in plain sight. We're in a neighborhood, just someone else's house. You'd never know it unless you looked at the plaque on the house and say, oh, the first home phone line was here. That's right. The unassuming Italianate at number one Arlington Street in Somerville is home to the very first residential telephone line. It's a huge deal, right? The very first one ever in the world. Fortunately, we made the right call in having an old friend along, Vince Valentine, the founder and director of the Telephone Museum in Waltham. Charles Williams Jr., he lived here, and he ran a telegraph shop manufacturing facility in downtown Boston. Where a fellow name of Alexander Graham Bell was creating the first two telephones, one of which came home here to the Williams house, and where, on an April day in 1877, Williams became the first man able to phone his wife from the office. So what was the first phone call? What did he say to his wife? Caroline, here I come. I'm coming home. Valentine brought along a replica of the first phone. Try losing this one. You speak in here and you listen in here. Big first phone, small first phone number though. Number one, right, number one. It's just one. Yeah, yeah, right. They've been called the greatest generation. But now, in their 80s, 90s, and older, the men and women who defended freedom in World War II are also a quickly vanishing generation, with nearly 400 of them dying every day. My own direct link to these heroes, my dad, died last year at 101. We still get World War II veterans who visit, not as many as we used to. Kara Fossey is the executive director of the Fort Devens Museum in Devens, Mass. It's on the third floor of an office-like building, easily missed driving by, but a peek inside is like taking a step back in time. We tell the history of Camp Devens and Fort Devens, starting back in 1917 when Camp Devens was built for World War I. By World War II, Devens was the main reception center for this entire region of the country which meant that everyone going into the army who lived in New England would come through Devons. Including they, my dad. Yeah, and my grandfather. Yeah. So a lot of, lot of people have that connection even if they think they don't. Most of what we have, we get via donations, kind of a combination of uniforms, photographs, equipment, documents. Probably the most interesting things we have, to me anyway, are letters and diaries. Because one of our priorities here in the museum is that we really try to focus on the individuals who came through here. Since 1917, and with the 100th anniversary of the official end of World War I just this year, the museum's newest acquisition, eight enormous books containing panoramic photos taken at Devon's as soldiers prepared to fight what was supposed to be the war to end all wars. 
304th Infantry Band. Yep, and that was 70th. part of the 76th Division, which, which trained here before heading overseas. Wow. You wonder how many of these poor guys came back. From World War II, a small but respectful nod to a favorite of mine, the storied 10th Mountain Division. Talk about a ski boot. But what the museum does best, and most poignantly, is remind visitors that everything here was worn, handled, or used by real everyday people. Most of them New Englanders, all of them simply answering their call to duty, for which succeeding generations are eternally grateful.